new videos every day. Hi, I'm Radia Gleese. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist. And I'm Peter McCarthy. I'm a certified traditional naturopath. And this is Wake Up America. Our subject today we're going to talk about is, is advocacy science. And basically that means the influence of money on scientific research. Now, Peter, I was reading this article and we were talking about it earlier. Science's worst enemy, corporate funding. Um, and this, uh, the, the byline here is, and you thought Bush, the Bush administration was bad. Tell us a little bit about this article and what it means. Okay, thanks. Um, for those of you who want to look it up, you can find it in the October 07 issue of Discover Magazine. It's available online in the archives. And there's a couple important points that uh, you need to understand that influence what we're talking about today. First of all, um, in 1965, 60% 60 of the scientific research was done in government laboratories. And none of the research scientists could gain anything financially from that. Well, today, 65% of the scientific research is now being done by privately funded companies. And in contrast to back then, many of these same scientists can now benefit financially from their scientific research. Well, you'd say, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Well, maybe it is. Uh, and part of the reason that this occurred was back in 1980, Senators Birch Bayh and Bob Dole helped to write and pass a legislation called, interestingly enough, the Bayh-Dole legislation. And it took those restrictions away so that from that point on, scientists could benefit from the results of their research financially. Now, as we move forward towards the present day, what that meant was that you now had many of these people working as corporate consultants for privately funded companies, corporations, who now wanted to be able to show that depending upon what their particular company was doing, that the product, the service, whatever you were talking about was scientifically valid, that it was backed up by good science. And to an increasing extent, you were able to show that because Professor so-and-so, PhD or MD, depending upon uh, what what field of, of uh, business you were talking about was able to lend their professional aura or gravitas to uh, this particular type of research. And as time has continued, more and more of this research has become less the search for truth, which really is the true purpose of real scientific research, and more to prove a point to be able to show that someone's product is safe or that it's more effective than another product. And as a result, we've created a system now in the United States where essentially science is for sale. And that is no more true than in the field of healthcare. And Radia, you were looking at an article uh, that I think our, mm -hmm. our audience would be interested in finding out about as well. Yeah, this was an article in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, and this was in August of 06. And you'll notice the title. It's interesting. It says, The Influence of Money on Medical Science. And I just want to read this one little paragraph here. It talks about two basic goals for for-profit companies are the discovery, testing, and production of products. That's the scientific goal. And then the sale of products uh, to garner profit, thereby generating returns to the shareholders. That's the marketing goal. Now, here's what this author says. In some instances, the marketing goal of a company dominates the scientific aspect of the company's funded research. There have been a number of high-profile examples of such research irregularities involving for-profit companies, such as the refusal to provide all study data to the study team, 
reporting only six months of data in a trial designed to have 12 months of data as the primary outcome, incomplete reporting of serious adverse events, and concealing clinical trial data showing harm. And Roddy, I think it's important that you tell us, our audience, who wrote this article? This is written actually by Ka uh, Catherine DeAngelis. She's an MD, but she was also the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And I think that really points up the fact that at a very high level in the medical profession itself, there are people who are concerned about what's going on in terms of the influence of money on scientific research. But you know, folks, it goes way, way beyond that. And what I mean by that is, I'm sure you all know that before a drug is brought to market, uh, it has to go through not only some rigorous clinical trials, but it has to meet an FAA advisory board who issues recommendations on whether or not that drug is safe for public use. Well, what a lot of people don't know about what's going on with the FDA right now is that they have on file hundreds of conflict of interest waivers. And what that means is that in some cases, you have researchers who not only participated in these trials, but also stand to benefit hugely in a financial way if this drug is brought, brought to market. And they sit on the same advisory panels that are going to approve those drugs. Now, back in the 1970s, to draw a historical parallel, there was a great big flap in this country after the Vietnam War about Department of Defense employees one day managing a defense contract for the government and the second day going to work for the, the defense contractor. And there were laws that were passed to prohibit just that kind of activity. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. There aren't any laws like that in this country today that prohibit this kind of thing going on in the healthcare system. But we believe there ought to be. Uh, in, and in other systems too, which we certainly know about. And we are going to talk about in, in later episodes, like um, earlier we were talking about aspartame. And uh, when you brought up and you did your little um, um, video on aspartame. You know, we got some interesting uh, feedback and comments, which is what we are going to be asking you your comments on um, the subjects that we're talking about. On that particular case, we had uh, somebody who wrote in and was quite disgruntled at some of the shocking things that we were saying about the research that was done in aspartame. Do you do you want to touch oh, upon that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, we uh, we had an interesting uh, response from uh, one of our uh, viewers in particular who uh, took exception to some of the things that we said about aspartame. But once again, you need to remember that all of the information that we are getting right now, or most of it anyway, about health and health care in this country is filtered through this advocacy science, money-dominated filter. So as we continue to talk about these subjects, please keep in mind that that's really is what at play here. And use a discerning eye. We're going to do our best to provide you with good quality, verifiable sources of information uh, so that you can make up your own mind about what's really going on. So keep watching our episodes. Uh, in the future, we're going to talk about media hypnosis and how um, it, it jades health reporting. We're going to talk about medical education or the lack of in uh, medical schools on nutrition and alternative and complementary medicine. So we've got a lot to uh, talk to you about. We want your feedback. Make sure that you go to our website, which is texashealthfreedom.com, and make sure that you sign in and... Um, uh, become a member of Psyche Truth so you can hear more. Check back with us and make sure you make your comments. We want to respond back to you. Thanks. We'll see you next time. There are over 350 videos on our channel, and I doubt you've seen them all. And the topics range from weight loss, nutrition, sexual health, all the way to psychology and mind control, and anywhere in between. And I think if you check them out, you're going to find some really interesting stuff.